334, we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Sixteen, one, two, and four. Just listen to the words. The words. The words, words yeah. Words. All those syllables would be like Raylan right there. <laughs> Books to twenty one.
you'll turn to 160 in your chorus book. Today, Pastor Rick has entitled his sermon, Perfect Unity. It comes from the book of John, chapter 17, verse 23. So if you'll stand for the reading of the word. I and them, you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and you have loved them even as you have loved me. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you anoint the gift that you've given Pastor Rick. Let him speak boldly. The message that you've helped him prepare. Fill us with your spirit, dear Heavenly Father, so that we may receive this message and speak boldly when the opportunities arise. But we thank you most of all for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we ask that you honor our prayer in his name. So we're going to continue turning on my microphone. Thank you, Don. Not that we need it here, but the, um, Kathy wants to hear me. <clears throat> so um, we're continuing our series on the high priestly prayer of Jesus found in John chapter 17. We're about ready to wrap the... the um, the, the series up, but remember, last week we kind of took a corner. So let's kind of get a review so we know where we are, and then we'll we'll continue on today. Um, remember, John uh, in John chapter 17, Jesus starts his prayer by asking for God to glorify him, and so that he can bring God glory. And we found that God glorified Jesus by fulfilling scriptures about Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel. All of that happened according to the scriptures, and that brings glory to God. <clears throat> we also saw that Jesus prays that they may have eternal life, these apostles. And he said, eternal life is this, to know the only, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And we talked about what the implication of that is, that understanding who Jesus really is. And, and we're going to talk about that in the next verse, because then we looked at this shared glory. 
And the one takeaway, the big takeaway from that sermon was only what is of God's receives God's glory. And to say that Jesus Christ had that glory we shared before the foundations of the world tells you that Jesus Christ is of God. But it goes on because we see then Jesus really intercedes specifically for his apostles, the, the 12. Um, and he prays five things. And this is something that has really changed my prayer life in this um, study that I've been doing. Jesus prays specifically for five things, and not one of them is healing. Not that we shouldn't pray for healing. Uh, it's not that, that we shouldn't. But the five things that Jesus prays for his apostles who are about to go through hell on earth, he prays knowledge, perseverance, joy, spiritual protection, and holiness. He doesn't pray for them to be taken off the earth. He doesn't pray that their life on earth will be easy. He prays for knowledge, perseverance, joy, spiritual protection, and holiness. And then he looks, uh, this is where he takes a corner. He then um, starts praying for me and all who will believe on their message. So the first thing he does is he reminds, um, or he tells of the perfect oneness that he and the Father have. And we saw last week, if the, the takeaway from last week, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Not that Jesus is the Father, but if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. That was one of the, that is one of the things the ministry of Christ is to do, is to reveal God to us. It's God in man reconciling himself to man, or man to himself. So this week, um, I want us to look at, last week we saw the perfect oneness in the Father and the Son. This week, he takes that oneness, that idea of oneness, and he applies it to all believers. And he talks about perfect unity. All right? So John 17, 21 through 23. I'm going to just back up a couple of verses from where Dad read to open, and, uh, and we'll get a run at this. It says, I pray, uh, in verse 21, John 17, 21, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. So this week, I want us to talk about the perfect unity, that they may experience perfect unity. So in your bulletin, uh, that blank is unity. So there's three things that I see um, this idea of perfect unity being expressed in uh, when Jesus is saying this. The first thing we have to understand is we're coming from a system that was not unified. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. It says, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He has united Jews and Gentiles into <coughs> one people. <coughs> when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with his commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. <coughs> Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. 
He is our peace who has broken down every wall. That's the scripture <coughs> that that song is rep uh, represents. The wall <coughs> between Jew and Greek, Jew and Gentile, Jew and other. There is no such thing anymore. God has united these people and one new people from two. That's the bank, blank in your bulletin. One new people from two. So this is the big idea. This is the, the, um, the, the revelation for that age. Because it certainly was not one people from two before Jesus. Look, you have to remember, the Jews had really alienated themselves um, completely from the world. And I use that word alienated on purpose. Um, God intended <clears throat> the Jewish people, the called out ones, the, the God's chosen people, to take his name to the world. Even in the Old Testament system, even though there were barriers for certain people, the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, the court of the Jews, and then the um, uh, holy place and the, the, the courtyard, the holy place, the most holy place. See, although those all had walls, there was still place for the Gentile believer. Not so much when a Jew was asked about the others. They were a, a less, um, less important people. Um, the example I have here in Luke 10, Jesus goes right at them. In Luke 10, uh, verses 30 and 33, <clears throat> really verses 30 uh, through 42 is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And when you get down to verse 32, uh, Jesus says this, a temple assist, okay, ah, boy. We could read the whole thing. I, just bear with me here, okay? So we'll start with the beginning of the parable. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. A Jewish man was beaten by bandits, okay, beaten and robbed. By chance, a priest, Jewish, came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed the other side of the road and passed by him. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Uh, you know, I can almost hear, uh, I'll pray for you. Then a despised Samaritan, that's what the scripture calls him, a despised Samaritan came along and when he saw the man he felt compassion for him and the rest of the story is he took care of him met his needs and even his future needs and Jesus asked who is this man's neighbor and of course the one who showed him love which even was a despised Samaritan see the Jews had alienated themselves from the world there were us and them and they were despised especially the Samaritans those half breeds but Jesus throughout his ministry was preparing for this breaking down of walls in John chapter 10 verse 16 Jesus tells um, the Pharisees um, 1016, he says, I have other sheep too that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd, even though he knew there were the, there was a uh, sheepfold of the Jewish people. There's others that would be coming and he was going to make them one flock with one shepherd. Romans 1 16, What's Romans 1, 16? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. 
first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. See, he is taking this idea of the gospel and taking it all throughout the world. It's not just for the Jewish people. They are not um, two groups anymore. We have one people, one shepherd. And in Galatians, Paul emphasizes this when he says, Galatians 3, 26 through 28, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free, male or female. For all are one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. See, he has broken down the walls. He has unified something that had been completely separated and mostly through human nature. <clears throat> so, perfect unity. The first thing we need to see is God, uh, through Christ, broke down this division of Jew and Gentile, Jew and other, that does not exist. But he takes it even further. Because here in Galatians, he doesn't just say there's no longer Jew or Gentile. He says there's no longer slave or free, male or female. female. They are all one in Christ. And we aren't talking about... Um, no genders. You understand that? What he's saying is there's no favoritism. There's no one more important than the other. That's emphasized in James chapter 2, 8 and 9. In James chapter 2, 8 and 9, James, uh, um, James is telling the church here yes indeed it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures love your neighbor as yourself but if you favor some people over others you are committing a sin you are guilty of breaking the law so James here is saying there should be no favoritism no favoritism. If you really want to look, I mean, use Tom Thompson's 2020 rule, go back 20 verses and see what he's talking about here. He starts with, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat in the ch to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? See, he goes into this whole no favoritism. So this idea of there is no Jew or Gentile, that was a big division. And boy, Paul spends a lot of time on it in General Electric Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians spends a lot of time talking about this division between Jew and Gentile that there isn't anymore and don't let those those Jewish fake believers <coughs> try to show you that <coughs> you need to do this that or the other thing to be saved because it's by grace he spends a lot of time on that but then he also takes it further and says there's no slave or free male or female because also they had been, been um, showing favoritism to certain classes of people. Do you understand that? And God is saying no favoritism. I just picked two verses. I mean, we could, the list could go on and on here about favoritism. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. 
one of my favorites. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. That's the thing. Nobody's more important than you. You're not more important than them. There is no favoritism. We should be looking out for each other. Look at Romans 12. I mean, we could read. Oh. Like I said, again, we could just read verse after verse. But I'll start with Romans 12, verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Uh, uh, down to verse 16. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just scripture after scripture about, listen, we are all one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. The, the thing is, Jesus has leveled the playing field. We are to be in unity, perfect unity, no matter what socioeconomic, no matter male or female, no matter slave or free, no matter what station in life we've been called to, in Christ, we are one. We don't favor it one or, oh, oh, uh, uh, Kevin Kramer, man, that is a nice shirt. Would you please come up here and sit right up front? Woo, I want to make sure everybody sees you. Uh, but Tom, could you take a step back, please? Uh, you know, I'd rather you didn't wear that beard here at church. That, that is not what we're all about, right? That's not what we're all about. So we should have perfect unity. I just can't think of, there's so many scriptures that come to mind, bear one another's burdens. There's this idea that we are in this thing together, no matter what each one's going through. No one's more important or less important, or we are all, all in, gathered in perfect unity. So, let's talk about this perfect unity. Let's just make sure we're all together. First, no Jew or Gentile, and that was a big one back then. It was a really a bone of contention uh, in the early church. It was a big one, and 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 um, uh, he is our peace who has broken down every wall. We, we don't have that wall of partition. Now, all, all these things that we, we talked about uh, and talked about in the Sunday school and we've been talking about here and coming into the courtyard and coming into this, and those walls have been broken down. There are no more walls. A Gentile, a Gentile could walk right up to the throne of grace. The walls have been broken down. Okay. So that perfect unity. But not only that, the widow that only has two mites can walk right up to the throne of grace, right along with the, the richest man in the world. There is no favoritism in God's eyes. All right? So <clears throat> that's the first two things. The last one that I really, I really want us to talk about is the elephant in the room. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 9. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 9 says, When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like the people of the world? After all, who is Apollos and who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believed the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, Apollos watered it, and it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both 
will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's fields, you are God's building. So, in your bulletins, they work together with the same purpose. Mansfield, four churches, a town of 350. So, why are there different churches? Well, there's lots of reasons why. There's personality differences. There's um, different styles of worship. There's distance. I mean, there's a, there can be a church in uh, uh, Wenatchee and a church in Mansfield because just of distance. There's tradition. And I'm not saying these are good or bad. There is difference in churches because of doctrine. And that's a whole other sermon. But the point is, sometimes we get caught up in, I am of Rick and I am of Leroy. And I am of Sam Buckingham and I am of the Catholic Church. And we should remember that we're all working for the same purpose. The trouble is, by human nature, we have the church of the waterers and the church of the sowers and the church of the... I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's right. And one of the things that we have made a conscious effort of is to be sure that we extend the hand of fellowship in trying to work together and make this unity in Christ more evident in this at least our little neck of the world trying to reach out to Leroy and Sam and trying to get the Christian unity to be evident among us would it be the best thing to just build one big church and have uh, one fellowship probably I don't know. I really don't know. Um, God's not surprised, and and God is um, God is not thwarted by different church buildings. But um, the one thing I can do is say, as far as it is concerning me, I will work to do my best to um, live in harmony and unity. Remember, John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. For your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Not your building, your one building, will prove to others that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Not your worship style, your one worship style, will prove to the others that you are my disciples. It's your love for one another that will prove that you are my disciples. So work to be not separate, but loving to one another in perfect unity. So, perfect unity. No Jew or Gentile. No favoritism. And to remind ourselves that here, there, there, or wherever, we're working with the same purpose. To build up the people of God. And showing love to there, 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 to prove to the world that we are his disciples. So I want to close with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 and 3 through 5. Ephesians 4, 3 through 5. <clears throat> That's Philippians. Did not. Ephesians 4, 3 through 5. That makes more sense now. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. 
binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God the Father, who is over all and in all and living through all. There is one body of Christ. And I'm not saying it's only here in this church. Get my drift? Make efforts to be united. Do it through the bonds of love. Love one another to show the world that we are his disciples. Remember our opening text. <laughs> John 17, 22. One part of our opening text. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. Only what is of God receives God's glory. We cannot be more united than we are when God gives us his glory. Amen? So, next week, John 17, 24 and 25, as we get ready to end our series on, perfect, uh, on the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. Alright, so, if you will all um, singers and musicians come and turn with me to chorus 168 in your chorus book I picked this song to end this service um, mostly because um, this idea of loving that brings or shows the world that we are his disciples is something that I think we can really emphasize to show unity in the body of Christ so um, we're going to sing verse 1 here, Love Through Me. <clears throat> love through me, love through me. Heavenly Father, we just ask that as your love is expressed in us, that it would also be manifest through us. Lord, let us love one another to show the world that we are your disciples. Lord, thank you for breaking down the walls of partition. Thank you for sh reminding us that there is no difference between one or the other in your view. So now, Lord, today, let us um, take that out, that realization and that love and share it with the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.